football group is doing. Last week they had Brady. This week they got Brady. We're doing it. We're literally doing it differently from everybody else. Hey, as a matter of fact, moving forward from this point on, I will not make reference to PFL. Ready to get into it? Yeah, yeah. All right. We're going team by team. I will be very careful about slinging stuff. Am I going to get sued? Is that legal on this? I like football, I like football season, and all the things that go with it. Welcome into the PFF NFL podcast, Steve Pelizola, Sam Monson. We're live here on YouTube. I do it differently, Sam. You do the cold open. You just jump right into it. I give the people the welcome in really loud into their earbuds. Yeah, you ruin the sound, uh, the the levels of the sound right off the bat, and yeah, then change but then things. I, but then we bring it back. But down. I figure I can't look. You've you've patented this, right? Not in yeah. a not in a Bruce Buffer kind of way. You're getting no money out of it. That's not why I'm avoiding Maybe it. But I, I figure. I can't steal your thunder. I can't just adopt your opening. So I got to come up with my own shtick. And apparently that's just the cold open. I like the cold open. It was good. I listened. I listened yesterday. I wanted right. to hear what you guys had to say about the offensive tackle class. While you should have been doing work, you were in fact listening to the show that you were not appearing on. It's called background noise, Sam. I see. I was working. I was working. Mm. Building products here at PFF. My main job. Um, so we got, we got a great show today. We're going to talk Patriots all day. We've done this the last few years calling it the autopsy, ah. right? You get into, we haven't done it with the Patriots yet, no. but you get it, you know, a few weeks into the season and we do autopsies at the end of the year. Like, hey, what went wrong? We do it when, when teams get eliminated from the playoffs, but sometimes you do it early. Like, why is a team one and four? Where did this come from? Why does it look so bad? So we're going to go through that. Um, I'm going to play a little GM in a little bit as well. Mm-hmm. And um, we got a little NFL news to discuss too. Anthony Richardson officially put on IR with his AC joint sprain. I believe it's a sprain. Grade three sprain. All right, good. Where does that? That's bad. I mean, grade, grade three is bad. One, one, two, three, and upwards. One sometimes, is like Sometimes nothing. lower is better or worse. Well, in this, yeah, in the sprain. Grade three is high. Charting mechanism or whatever. Yeah, one is like nothing. You just tweaked it. Grade three is bad. It's a full separation. The way I saw it described is, you know, the, the joints meet like this. It's where it's 100% of, like, it's it's all the way out. And it's throwing, it's throwing shoulder? Yeah. That seems rough. Yeah, that's a um, problem. So it's, it's four games. I believe the fifth game is a Germany game against New England. So, an, un, you know, even then, maybe unlikely to see him. I've, we might not see him for five or six weeks yes. at least here. I feel like he's out for I mean, the four game is a minimum thing, right? For the IR, which right. means that's how long he's definitely done for. I suspect he's out for a while. So that's some news. Um, I don't know if there's any other news, but I'll tell you this: as a parent, you've had to learn so many new skills to provide for your family. I have how to do copious amounts of laundry, meal plan for even the pickiest eater, and now how to protect your family's financial future. Well, Fabric by Gerber Life prevents provides. An easy one-stop shop for your family's financial <laughs> needs. It doesn't prevent anything. It offers high-quality term life insurance policies plus other financial solutions in one easy online hub. Fabric was, de- Fabric was designed by parents for parents to help you get a high-quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policy in less than 10 minutes. Fabric has flexible policies that fit your family and your budget, like a million dollars of coverage for less than a dollar a day. Get your personalized quote in just minutes and then apply when it's convenient for you. It's all online and on your schedule. You can go from start to cover in less than 10 minutes with no health exam required. So join the thousands of parents who trust Fabric to protect their family. Apply today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash PFFNFL. That's meetfabric.com slash PFFNFL. M-E-E-T fabric.com slash PFFNFL. Policies issued by Western Southern Life Insurance Company. Not available at certain states. Prices subject to underwriting health questions. Nice. You might notice last week we did do our a weekly preview on Wednesday. Mm-hmm. The people seem to like it a little bit more yeah. on Wednesday. It has a little more more time to live, I think is what it is. But we'll be back to our normal Thursday schedule, so we'll go game by game tomorrow. Today's our mailbag and fun, and, you know, we're just going. Yeah, I did it again. I let the mailbag pile up, uh, and I had to trawl through it all. And now the, mo- now the mailbag comes via various different avenues. We've got the actual email mailbag. There's no actual mailbag, by the way. Nobody... We haven't had anything mailed physically to the building for we quite should. some time. We should. Um, well, people that owe us coffee will be doing that that's soon. True. The email bag has been stuffed to the brim. Um, NFL podcast at pff.com. That's where to send emails, and we'll be reading out some of those too. There's also the Discord mailbag, I guess. There's a, uh, a channel in the Discord that is questions of the week 
where we will be reading out a question of the week. We'll have one of those later. Uh, the link to the Discord is in the description of this show. You'll find it on YouTube or the audio as well. Come hang out in the Discord and uh, fire in your questions or, you know, pick teams. Yeah. Like I, was hanging out, I was hanging out on the Discord the other night. Oh, yeah? Not as many people there, but I was uh, co- college football Saturday night while I was watching. Yeah. You said I should get on there and do a little AMA. Hmm. And uh, there was only one person asking questions, but we will. It was just a bad time of the day. But, uh, you know, I'll hang out maybe like a college Saturday night. You just had a one on one AMA with somebody. Yeah. 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 <coughs> consulting. Okay. Cool. Doing some yeah. consulting. All right. You want to get into Patriots autopsy? Okay. You want to start with that? What do you want to do? Uh, well, okay. Do Let's start with this, right? We, as a listener of the show yesterday, you will be aware that there was one particular email that was going to come in. Oh, this geez. one was from a, a fan named Trevor Sikama. Gents, long time fan of the show. I have a question for the mailbag episode. That's today. Uh, what is the largest animal either of you could defeat in combat with your bare hands? All the best, Trevor. Huh. You're, you're expecting. Yeah, I heard you talking me up here. Uh-huh. You have high expectations for me. I mean. Based off my size. High-ish. Yeah. I'm also aware that you're not, you know... I'm a gentle giant is what it is. Gentle giant. You're also lacking whatever physical prowess a professional athlete once had in him. Ah, I see. So you've got some sort of certain innate giant man strength, you know, that doesn't leave you when you're that size. Having said that, you don't really move around that well. So so agility is a factor here? Yeah. You know I mean, the way that the mountain in Game of Thrones was susceptible to the, the fast jinky guy that could like yoink. You Celos in the chat thinks I could fend off a cheetah. Huh. Maybe. This is hand to hand combat, right? So it's yeah. not so much like agility and speed might be taken out of this. Well, no, I mean it's gonna be a factor, but the question is can the agility and the speed offset the giant club meat ham hook hands you've got? Do I have any training here? Uh-huh. I have um I have not been in many fights <laughs> in my life. However, there was a little dust up one time, a little yeah. after college. And got my hands dirty a little bit. Yeah. And uh, took care of business. That's what I'm saying. You know, things, the, the rage went off in my head. And I went and. The red mist. Yeah. Came down. It was, uh, we were outnumbered, but we held our own. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I, I might have it in me, plus dad strength. But I'm, one, I'm not a fighter, is my point. Right. I'm not a fighter. So, you know, like a squirrel. I can take out a squirrel. Squirrel. Squirrel's been eating all my garbage. It's a pretty small animal to be. I know. You got to aim I don't know. It. What do you think I could beat? I don't want to spend too much time on this, to but I want to give Trevor man. his due. Yeah. I mean, he's a, fan, a long-time fan of the show. Yeah. He took it. the time to email, even after appearing on the show and saying he was going to do it. Yeah. So, yeah, I think you should. I appreciate I, so the dedication. I've always, I've thought about this before because it's one of those things that people talk about, you know, men. I, know I don't, I don't think this. women tend to think about this. This is one of those like Roman Empire things. Like Rome. Yeah. Uh, I feel that the largest animal that I could realistically take down, I've said this before somewhere, it might even be on this show. Now that I think about it, we may have done this already. I feel it's a female deer, a non-antlered deer. Yeah. Right? With your own hands. Yes. Now they get pretty big. But they're spindly. And yeah, sure, they can bounce around and stuff. But if you get hold of one, you know, you can just lock that choke in and, and it's done. Then similar. What's, what, what would be a step above you gotta that? you got to go larger deer, you know? A larger deer. A male deer. Yeah. I don't know. You wanna, I don't know if you want to be messing with the antlers. You, you need to just find a larger version of a deer. I got the reach over the antlers. You get the re- No, you don't. Okay, maybe not. Those things are big. Yeah. No, I could take it down. The other thing is, like... If you want to get creative and out of the box, could you take out a whale simply by like blocking its blowhole? I don't know, man. I don't. I don't know. This is like you should have answered it with Trevor <laughs> on the show, maybe. Anyway, okay. So that's our first mailbag. Now it's you not, want to talk Patriots? A thousand rats or one lion? Like, give me the lion, Charles, in the chat. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a popular one as well. Give me the go, lion. It's the rats every time. Give me the lion. The rats bear plague. Also, yeah. they're pretty big now. You've seen New York rats? You got a thousand of those I things? don't like field mice. Right. Like one now of imagine them. one of those like eight times bigger. No, not in on it. All right, what are we talking about now? Uh, the Patriots and why they stink. All right, the New England Patriots. How did they get here? 
they're one in four. And it's not just one in four. By many different metrics, worst offense in the league, worst passing offense, worst rushing offense, one of the worst offensive lines. The point differential. They've scored 55 points. I think that's the fewest in the NFL. And given up 131. They're 0-3 at home. They've now, in the Bill Belichick era, lost more games at home without Tom Brady than they have with Tom Brady. So basically in three or four years, four years, three plus years without Tom Brady versus 20 years with. The one in four Patriots. How did they get here? I've got some thoughts. Okay. Where would you start? Um, well, Tom Brady left. It's a good starting point. Yeah. That's a good starting point. Uh-huh. I mean, a big, a big part of this, though, was what were the expectations for this season in New England? I'll tell you, my expectations were similar to the last couple of years. They were going to be a, a pretty good team, a mid-tier level team that, as I said before last week's show, beat the teams they're supposed to beat and then lose to good teams, right? They're going to lose to Buffalo unless there's 60-mile-an-hour wins. They're going to lose to the Dolphins, who are a better team. They're going to lose to the Chiefs later this season. They're going to get waxed by the Cowboys, who are a better team. But they're also going to beat up on Zach Wilson's Jets. They're going to beat up on Sam Ellinger when he's the quarterback of the Colts. They're going to beat up on teams that, that aren't as good overall. But now it's way worse than that. Like Just from the two-week flip of the switch here, it looks even worse than that. How do, they, how do they get to the point of just mediocrity? I think Tom Brady fully explains that, right? You go from mm-hmm. a guy that's going to um, cure any kind of uh, roster construction issues, and I think they've had those through the years, but the, the standard was just higher. So that's the – how do they get to mediocre? That's the first thing. But how do they get to bad is the second question for the Patriots. Um, I mean, a big part of it is – they just don't have a lot of talent, and they haven't been doing well at, at acquiring talent. Um, obviously, Mac Jones, you know, you, Tom Brady leaves. Now your single biggest thing is how do we get the next quarterback? They went with Mac Jones. That hasn't yet worked out. At the very minimum, it's a, you know, we don't really know yet, uh, but it's looking worse than it is good. But just look at their drafting in recent years. <coughs> it's been bad. Yeah. I mean, most of the hits are running backs. Which is not a good thing. Like, you know, Damian Harris in the third round isn't a bad pick, but it's not great either. Ramondre Stevenson in the fourth round is a pretty good pick. But again, like, that's not doing too much for you. Other than that, like, where are the hits? There's a couple of them here or there, but it's like one or two a draft, and they're, they're typically at non-impact positions, like Michael Owenu in the sixth round. It is a really good draft pick. But the top draft or the top picks, um, you know, they had – Two second rounders, Kyle Duggar, who's fine, but he's a safety. Josh Uche is pretty good, but he's a situational type of pass rusher rather than an every down guy. You know, they just haven't had the the impact players. And when they have had a high draft pick or a first rounder, they've either whiffed or picked a player that hasn't made a massive impact yet. I, I'm putting this particular draft to the side, like last year's, because. It happened five minutes ago. Christian Gonzalez looks like maybe an early hit. Now right. he's out for the season. But he's like, you know, four games in, and now he's done for the yeah. year. So I don't think it's, I think we can call that a success yet. So my, my high end theory here, Sam, and I, I touched on it a little bit on the podcast the other day, and I, I tweeted through it the other day. My high end theory, and, or the question I'll pose how much do you think Bill Belichick, as the GM, his team building has been skewed by having Brady on the team? Because, you know, again, we're the, the, we're the sky is falling, you know, part of this New England rebuild here. And it's like, well, Belichick's never had a team this bad. And that's probably, like, as far as pure offensive line plus playmakers, yeah, it's probably true, right? Maybe the worst team. But it's not like the team building in New England has was pristine for 20 years throughout the dynasty. Right. The problem was, like, they rolled out a bottom three wide receiver core in multiple seasons with Tom Brady. They rolled, They made it to the AFC Championship and one play away from the Super Bowl with uh, the 31st-ranked pass-blocking offensive line in the NFL back in 2015. They made it to the Super Bowl in a year where Matthew Slater, a special teamer slash wide receiver, was playing safety. 
and Julian Edelman had to go play slot corner. And at the time, it was like, oh, look, look at Bill Belichick. Oh, he's you know, flexible, and he uses all these guys and everything. It's like, no, they had the second-worst defense in the league that year. But because you have Tom Brady in this passing attack, you still you know, are a player or two away from winning a Super Bowl. So how much of you're going through this, you know, when Tom Brady leaves, in the back of Belichick's mind, it's like, why do I need to make a splash play at wide receiver? We won Super Bowls with David Patton and David Givens. Mm. Why do I need to make a splash play at receiver? We, made, we won the Super Bowl with Cordero Patterson, Chris Hogan, and Philip Dorsett on the outside. You had Edelman and, and, Gron, and older Gronk, but these, uh, how much of that is going through his head? Right? Do, why do I need to invest in this thing? Because we've done it before. You know, so I, I wonder how much, not, not, it's not like a Brady versus Belichick thing. I wonder how much the impact of Tom Brady actually just skews Belichick, what Belichick thinks he can get away with as the general manager. Brady, or Belichick rather, reminds me a little bit of, you know, somebody that sort of refuses to accept inflation as a thing. It's like, this is how much this should cost. Yeah. Therefore, I refuse to pay more than this for the thing, even as the market continues to push the price up and up and up, whether it's supply, demand, whatever the, the cause is. But he's just like, it's not worth more than that. I'm not spending more than that. But at some point, if you need the thing, you just have to pay what it's being sold for. Like you can't, you know what I mean? There's no fixing that. There's no saying, no, I refuse. I stubbornly I'm determined that it isn't worth more than this sum of money, and therefore I'm not paying that for it. If it's not going to come down to that price, you have to reassess what you're willing to pay. So Belichick is out here still like bargain basement shopping, like waiting for Randy Moss to be available for a fourth round pick at a cut price contract, and it's just not happening, right? Nobody's yet found, like that's, that's not repeating itself. So you either except that that's the reality and you're going to have to actually overpay sooner or later for a guy somewhere just to get it done or you kind of get where they are which is the steadfast refusal to adapt and to change to the reality of the marketplace leaves you with a bunch of guys that aren't good enough so the interesting thing in all this is remember the second year after brady so 2020 was the first year without brady they go get cam newton but in 21 they draft mac jones and that was the year that was the offseason where they went nuts in free agency. Right. Relative, right? I mean, they, they, they got a lot of those contracts. Uh, you know, they, they weren't egregious contracts by year two or three, but that was when they spent a ton on Nelson Aguilar and Hunter Henry and John New Smith and Matthew Judon. And um, there was someone else in there that was big money, right? Like Jalen Mills or whoever. And, and so the, even the time that they spent, it was like, okay, you spent a ton of money. But your your competitors right now are going to get not at the same time frame but your competitors are going to get Tyreek Hill right right and so that was where at the time you're talking about hey he hasn't adjusted here Mac Jones is sitting there on a rookie contract so this isn't even apples to apples if you say well Tom Brady took a hometown discount and everything it's like well Tom Brady took enough of a discount that maybe you get and one more player Right, you get your average starting linebacker. You could bring Kyle Van Noy back or whatever it might be. But when that's nothing compared to what a Mac Jones rookie contract gives you. So you can go make splash moves. And look, we are at the point where splash moves are not what they used to be. They used to be like, oh man, you don't go pay, you know, don't go pay Albert Hainsworth 100 million in free agency. Go don't go pay Indomitian and Sue. Don't go do that stuff because good teams build through the draft and they don't they don't hit on free agents. And there's risk in free agency. But teams actually hit on those things now, right? Like Tyreek Hill has helped transform the Dolphins. Those big moves. A.J. Brown, I know these are trades, but A.J. Brown has gone and transformed the Eagles. And so that's where I think New England's lacking. While every, not only do they have you know, money spent in the wrong areas, as everyone around them, right? How are you going to go beat Josh Allen and the Bills? How are you going to beat these teams? As everyone around them is getting better and better, and making these aggressive moves, New England's just like, nope, this is how we've done it. Yeah, This is I, how we've done it for 20-plus years. And I do wonder if that spending spree kind of reinforced that opinion of, look, I, I tried it your way. I went and blew all the money, and look what I got for it. Nothing. Yeah. You know? So now I'm going back to my way, which is I only shop for value. You know, I, I, I'm only shopping in the reduced bargain bin, you know, the stuff that's expiring next week. And that's how I'm building this thing. 
And it's, it's just not going to do it. Like, if you don't have Tom Brady, that doesn't work. You yeah. can't construct a roster that's good enough around a guy that you still don't know is able to play quarterback yet. Like, it's not going to work that way. Um, so, yeah, I think, that's, I think that's the main point, man. Like, they hit – remember, they hit lulls in the dynasty era, right? In this 20-year run, they hit these lulls where the defense fell apart a little bit, the receiving core fell apart, they bounced back. But, again, it just feels like – so the point I was trying to make on Twitter the other day is Belichick can remember a time when he made any kind of move and it worked, right? So they had, they made the AFC, in 06, they made the AFC championship with Jabbar Gaffney as the number one wide receiver. Right. And they corrected it the off, in the offseason and they went and got Randy Moss and then went 16-0 and in the regular season and broke records. They also, so it's like there's a point in history where they made an aggressive move, which wasn't actually that aggressive. It was a buy low on a fourth rounder and they got hall of famer randy moss and then they also three years later traded randy moss after week four and brady went on and improved that year and it was mvp of the league that year so in belichick's mind right he's like well i've made i've made moves to bring in a randy moss but i've also traded randy moss and become better you know so it's it it's probably easy for him to look at this receiving core coming into the year and like Devontae Parker, Kendrick Bourne, Juju Smith-Schuster, uh, Demario Douglas in the draft, Butte in the draft, uh, Thornton as a deep threat. That's not even close to the worst receiving core they've ever had. No. It's really not. Yeah. And, and so in his head, it's like, I've made this work before. Yeah. But the reality is, I think Tom Brady made it work before. Tom Brady, the adaptability that the Patriots had for years was made to work because Brady was at the helm. And it didn't matter, for the most part, what they threw at him. When they did have good off-seasons, though, they were more likely to win a championship. Somebody brought up, I forget where this came from, could have been the email, um, and I'm sorry for not give, crediting the person who sent it in, if so, but how much should we be looking at Nick Casario and giving him credit for this sort of bargain shopping approach that worked for decades and now no longer works because all of a sudden nothing's working in, in New England, but the Texans... Now that they have a quarterback and an offensive coordinator and a good defensive coordinator, good coaching, their bargain basement shopping seems to be working. Like True. They bring I mean, in guys did. like Shaq Mason for pennies on the dollar, you know, and that works. You get a guy like Tank Dell in the third round, and oh, look, Tank Dell's amazing. Um, like, they've actually started to hit on these guys that didn't work until all that stuff was in place. It's probably a fair question. Um, it didn't look great initially for Casario in the bargain, right. bar, uh, bargain basement, but I don't know if the bargain basement shopping is what is working for Nick Casario. I think it's drafting high and, and actually having, having picks now, getting yeah. rid of Watson and, and resetting that roster. I guess the question is, right, in the, in the 20-year dynasty, right, New England, they still won when they, they lost Charlie Weiss's offensive coordinator and they lost Bill O'Brien – they lost Josh McDaniels and brought him back. Like, they won with all those guys. Didn't matter wh who it was. They had Scott Pioli as GM. They had Nick Casario in there. But in, in, so maybe Casario has some aspect of it, or maybe just all of those personnel losses over the years. All of them finally caught up where it, Belichick got all the credit, but you do have to have good people around you. But it's a fair question to ask, was Casario the guy there? But look, it's 2018 or 19 is when – this downtrend started on New England's roster. Sure. And, and Casario was there for three of those years. But I think it's interesting that, you know, it might just be a case of, like, certain conditions need to exist in order for the bargain basement shopping to work. Like, okay, Tom Brady is obviously one of them, but it might not even need to be Tom Brady if you simply have a viable quarterback slash coaching. But, like, guys like Steven Nelson, you know, who was a good starting corner for a while, and the league looked like the league was kind of done with him, and then the Texans get him for – not much. I mean, he's like $6 million or something, and now he's looking like he's always looked, right? So they've got, I think, a ton of these moves that this year seem to be working because the conditions required for that to look okay are now in existence. I think there's probably something to it in terms of it's a mix, right? It's part of this is, is Nick Casario, part of this is Belichick, and they're both working con in conjunction right now in the opposite direction. There's also this element of when the foundation, we went back to this with Houston, right? When the foundation is so weak or there's a crack in the foundation, it almost yeah. doesn't matter if you hit on those things. Because if, look. Not, you not can't to, even tell if you hit on them. If things. you had an elite quarterback, 
and they were good, somebody would be like, man, they rejuvenated Jabril Peppers' career. Like, they have those examples on the roster, right? They turned Jabril Peppers into a, a pretty useful player. They've been finding the Jonathan Joneses of the world at, at corner, right? They, they maybe hit on Jack Jones last year as a, whatever he was, fifth-round corner. Uh, Michael Nwenu would be an incredible story as a sixth-round guard slash tackle who has played extremely well for the majority of his career. It's not like they're without these examples on the roster. It's just that the starting point is so much lower, right? Mm -hmm. they, they, those are the same types of players who are fun stories on a Super Bowl-caliber team who now are kind of like afterthoughts because the team can't win. But they're the same players. So I don't know that they've completely missed on all of the, the mid-level type of players that they you know have gone after the last couple of years. Is it fixable? <clears throat> I mean, anything's fixable. We see these things turn around. But I think there's so much that needs to be fixed. Um, I mean, even the offensive line. So like, it, let's not forget, in 2021, the Patriots were pretty good. Right? They were a pretty good team. They still had elements of what I described earlier. They would beat the bad teams. Right, They put up 50 on a bad Jets team that year. And they would lose to the good teams other than the Titans. They've beaten one 10-win team since 2020. One 10-win team um, other than the Bills game when the 60-mile-an-hour wins. And so fixable, like they were good. They were a pretty good team a couple of years ago. Um, but the offense, like they didn't address the offensive line very well this offseason. They let a lot of things slip. So what's fixable here? Um, you just, I mean, I, I give the same answer to every team, right? There are good players in free agency. The Matt Filer rule, I'll always say, right? There is a there is a two to three million dollar starting guard available in free agency if you want to go get him. That's that's possible. Um, the the thing that I would say is they need to change the focus to yeah we need we need those impact players that we pretty much avoided for 20 plus years we need the the fantasy football players we need pass catchers we need game changing pass catchers and they haven't played that game they they had gronk um, they traded for they only had moss for two years plus three years plus they need to go that route in my opinion and I, this isn't new like i said this before the season i said this back at the draft I thought that the first draft pick after Brady left was telling. They kept trading down in that draft, and they just drafted Kyle Duggar, which was like, you know, a nice, good safety that's versatile that Belichick's going to make into a, a pretty good player. And so it just felt like their status quo. It's the same Patriots that they were for 20 years. They need to be more aggressive and do all of the stuff that sports radio wants and that fans want, and you have to get shiny objects in New England especially when you have a rookie contract quarterback. And that's where they've that's the biggest thing where they've lacked in addition to letting the O-line fall apart. They're not a they're not a destination anymore. Like they haven't they're they're they were a team where people would take, you know, a slightly cheaper deal to go to New England and play with Tom Brady and win a Super Bowl. That's not there anymore and Bill Belichick is not that kind of draw. So in a in a weird world when it comes to market and free agency, like they've become the Jags. If you want these guys, you're actually going to have to overpay to get them, not just pay market value. Yeah. You you actually need to come out here and pay more than somebody else is willing to pay to get them, and you're already reluctant to pay what somebody else is willing to get them to pay to get them. That's going to be a tough adjustment for them to make. That's why I I, I hate when we put so much on the quarterback sometimes because I like analyzing the other positions. But that's another factor when it comes to the elite quarterback. Right, so where does the elite quarterback bring value? Well, on the field, obviously, the way they play. And we might calculate that with something like war, right? And of course, you know, Brady's been the most valuable quarterback of the PFF era and, you know, was the most valuable quarterback in the league six or seven times. And, you know, that was the foundation, right? In addition to uh, making players around them better, which is tougher to quantify with numbers, right? Like, does Dion Branch have as good of a career without Tom Brady? Probably not, right? Because we kind of explored that. We saw that. And then there's the, the attraction part of it. So the elite quarterback has so much of an impact on the team beyond what he just does on the field. It's also bringing other players in. It's also making other players better. And then again, I think it, it, it also skews your previous decisions. It skews what you saw, right? You made this decision to get these types of players and they, they were thriving in your system when realistically maybe it was 
again, because the elite quarterback just skews things. We're also back to we don't really know what Bill Belichick values in a quarterback, and he's probably going to need to start again because whether or not Mac Jones can be the guy, I, it's, it's looking like it's not going to happen in New England if it's ever going to happen. So this offseason, if Bill Belichick's even still there going forward, they're probably starting over a quarterback again. So yeah. it sounds like a great draft for that to be the case. But what does he value in a quarterback? We're back to that again. Like, remember when they were looking the first time? There was that. It was the class where Mac, on one end of the spectrum you had Mac Jones, and on the other end of the spectrum you had Justin Fields or Trey Lance, you know, hyper-athletic, toolsy quarterbacks. You know, like, where does Bel- Bill Belichick actually value? Because you had Tom Brady for 20 years. That's going to skew things. On the other hand, the first thing you did after he went was bring in Cam Newton. And that doesn't – like, those things don't mesh. There was no real logic to, like, the, the backups that he brought in to Brady time after time after time. They weren't a consistent style or thread of player. So we're back to clean slate, Bill. Where are we going to QB? The, uh, my, my wrestling analogy, because, like, people like to uh, – I've used this before on the show – People like to do is it you know Brady credit Belichick credit and everything. The uh, wrestling analogy was uh, Eric Bischoff was running WCW and came up with the idea of the NWO, which is like the greatest wrestling angle of all time. And it and there you know it, it made a ton of money and it was it put you know they had Monday Night Wars because of it. It was a great thing. Eric Bischoff came up with that idea. He deserves credit for that. He hasn't come up with after, after he was still, you know, running wrestling organizations. He never came back with like a similar idea, so he deserves credit for the thing he built. But it also didn't mean that he was going to come up with the next great idea. You understand? Mm-hmm. I feel like Belichick and Brady are similar, right? Like Bill Bel- in Bill Belichick's job description is to find good players and develop them. He did that with Tom Brady. At the same time, clearly, once you have that. We're finding out that is that is the reason why your your floor was the AFC Championship in most seasons, and your ceiling is six championships. Now, the question is, like Eric Bischoff, do you do you trust do you do you call Eric Bischoff say, hey, come up with another idea, man? I need another NWO. What's the next thing that's going to get hot in wrestling? Can you trust Bill Belichick to make the next move? Right? Is he going to just because he? discovered Tom Brady and made a, an incredible, imagine discussing that on the podcast in 2001. He benched one of the highest paid quarterbacks in the NFL and Drew Bledsoe benched him for unproven second year, sixth rounder Tom Brady, which was absolutely the right move. Credit to Bill Belichick. Is there, but is there any reason why Bill Belichick's the guy to, to make the next move, to find the next Tom Brady, to, you know, to, to identify the next starter? And we're a few years into it, and there's nothing that says, sure, he's got it. You know, so that's, that's what's interesting to me is Belichick deserves credit for the Brady aspect of things to a point, right? But I also don't know if he's the right guy to, to pick the next quarterback. I mean, if all you saw was the Patriots and everything they've done since Tom Brady left and had, like, if Bill Belichick was just a – a white paper head coach like you had no idea who this guy was you just had his resume from 2000 from when Brady left onwards there's nothing in there that would make you say he should be the guy leading the next search in fact you would be saying like you would be saying at the very minimum he's getting stripped of his GM powers right we're gonna we're gonna take this off your plate remember when the Andy Reid or yeah was it all these there's a ton of these head coaches who had all the power and then the first thing that happened when it started going wrong is you've got too much on your plate you're spread too thin we're going to take the personnel decisions out of it mike holmgren i think had that as well yep. it's happened to all these kind of guys along the way where things went wrong and, and you don't want to get rid of him because you know he's a good coach so let's take some of the responsibility away right but if that that would be the minimum you would be saying about belichick right now if you didn't know the previous 20 years is like okay bill we think you're spread too thin you know you, some decisions here we don't love we're gonna we're gonna take the personnel away and leave you to focus on the coaching you know and the maximum you'd be looking at and going bill <laughs> this is this is headed to an end here if if things don't turn around pretty quickly i, I don't know if we can continue doing this so i i mean the only thing keeping you from saying or the only thing making you say yeah bill's gonna have another shot at this is the previous credit in the bank, which at minimum is debatable how much of that is simply Tom Brady. 
that since Brady left, and I know you know the first year they went five and eleven, they went zero and two before Brady became the starter. I mean, he was five and thirteen as Patriots head coach before he went to Brady, and and he had one good year in Cleveland as a head coach, right? I mean, the, when you look through the history, I know a lot of people put the Brady, the Belichick wit, wit and without Tom mm-hmm. Brady numbers, and you know they're not great. Again, I I think he deserves credit for finding, developing, and choosing Tom Brady. But yeah, you're right. And so I don't know what happens at the end of the year here with Bob Kraft. Yeah. I don't I don't think a conversation I, I think it's all or nothing. I don't think there's a world where Bill Belichick, the GM, gets fired. Right. I don't see that. Unless it's like, hey, we're bringing in Scott Pioli again or Thomas Dimitrov or uh, we're bringing Casario back, and right. he's going to be uh, the GM. You, got, you guys have worked together before, but he's just going to have a little bit more. I just can't picture that world. Yeah, I can't see yet. Yeah, I mean, aside from anything else, like who could you possibly bring in to install above a Bill Belichick, essentially? Like how would that even function? Bill Parcells? Right, <laughs> exactly. Like imagine some whoever the sort of the next GM candidate is. Imagine that guy rocking up, you know, some fresh-faced 42-year-old, and it's like, now Bill reports to you. I'll be 42 next year. There you go. Not fresh-faced, though. Wow. <laughs> I'll dye my hair again. No, that's true, yeah. Um, Bill, have you seen the draft model? But like, Had how? you drafted with my model, yeah. you'd have A.J. Brown and Debo Samuel Bill, on your team. take a seat. I'm going to show you how the model works, and this is how we're drafting from now on. Like, how— I'll go back home. That can't function from a— that's just, it's an unreasonable thing to ask like any new GM to deal with is this like legacy hero is now your subordinate yeah and he had your job five minutes ago make that work and that's like I think I still think Belichick's a good coach and in the overall way that we evaluate coaches is like wins and losses and did they go forward on fourth down yeah and right and so that's too simple but there's definitely this world where Again, if he was not aggressive on fourth down and like punted in opposing territory when Brady was the quarterback, like you get away with that. Like you're going to score later in the game. When you do that last week against the Saints, when you're and it's just because our offense is terrible right now, we can't do that. It's like you know you need to change. You're the underdog now, man. You're not the favorite. Like you need to make these uncomfortable decisions. He hasn't adjusted there from a coaching standpoint. He's got to make that adjustment too, from a coaching standpoint, and just. Developing a Jabril Peppers every year, you know, developing this eight-year veteran into a useful player, like that's not enough anymore. So I, I think he's still a good coach, and those things matter. But there's also drastic changes he probably has to make there as well, not just on the GM side. I mean, he's also a defensive specialist. When I think in today's NFL, like the impact he can have as the coach, you know, the whatever percentage he's adding to the personnel, the talent that's there. I think it's just less on the defensive side than it is on the offensive side. Like if he was still the mastermind schematic wizard, but an offensive specialist, they'd probably be better than they are right now. If he was Andy Reid. Yeah. Like if, if Andy Reid had a similar problem, right? Post Patrick Mahomes, the personnel collapses. Andy Reid was making all the personnel decisions, yada, yada. Like I think he would prop it up better than Bill Belichick because you can have more of an impact on offense than you can on defense in today's NFL. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting at the end of the season. Look, I, I think New England, I, I don't think they're going to get outscored 72-3. to three. <laughs> You know, I, I don't think they're going to not score touchdowns. Every week. Every single week. I think they'll be a little bit better. That's not unprecedented, right? Like the Dolphins were 1-7 and seven a couple of years ago, and they became a very competitive team, 1-7 straight. I'm not, New England's not, I don't think they're going to be competing for the number one overall pick. I think they'll be a little bit better. Um but it's still, at the end of the day, even if the Patriots came into the season and went 8-9 and nine again, we would be having these conversations, right? If they just went 8-9 and nine right. and were competitive and beat the teams they were supposed to and lost the teams they were supposed to lose to, we'd be having the Belichick hot seat conversations. Now it's accelerated because they did get whooped 72-3 to three over the last two weeks. And it's going to be a challenge just to get to 8-9. and nine. So even if they show signs of life, at the end of the day, this is a five, six, seven win team at best. And yeah, so we're still I mean, gonna be having these conversations at the end of the year, and we really might be seeing the end of the Belichick era and just see a complete overhaul by next year. Yeah, I think last week changed the dynamic because it highlighted a I think a new depth to how bad this can get. Yeah. Losing thirty eight to three against Dallas. Okay, that was bad. But at the time Dallas looked like one of the best teams in the NFL, and we know the Patriots aren't. So that was kind of like, okay. 
that was ugly, but that can happen. The fact that they backed that up with a potentially even worse loss to New Orleans, who aren't that good, aren't great, is really concerning. And now the next three games, you know, if they don't look demonstrably better against the Raiders, who are still, I think, one of the worst teams in the NFL, and then your next two are Buffalo and Miami, like if they can't bounce back and be competitive in those games, now you are staring down like a start of what, like one and six, one and seven at the start of the season, and you're like, this could get really bad. Yeah, we're spending a lot of time on it because it, it's just a, it's a fascinating story. And other, other dynasties historically, you know, like the Niners transitioned from Montana to Steve Young and won another Super Bowl. Um, you could say like the Dolphins spent years looking for the next Dan Marino. They weren't really a dynasty, but they went from obviously really competitive for years to trying to find their way. Uh, Dallas still hasn't won a Super Bowl since 1995, and they've had their ups and downs. It's just a, it's an interesting story because the team that's been sitting near the top for years, and I know we're three years removed from that world, but the team that was sitting near the top for 20 years is now looking at a top five pick if the season ended right now, and that's a, that's a, a big story around the NFL. Yep. All right, man, I got to tell everybody about our, our daily fantasy picks with prize picks for tomorrow night. So we got Thursday night football, and so we're going to our friends over at Prize Picks, and we have a PFF. Here are the PFF picks for 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 Prize Picks for Thursday night football. We're going to go more than a half touchdown, rushing plus receiving, half touchdown for Javante Williams plus Rasheed Rice. So we're combining them. Rasheed yeah, Rice, cool. they're yeah. like combo. Uh... I like that. Picks. So Rice found the end zone last week. Javante Williams, the Broncos running back, they're going to go more than half a touchdown combined. And we're also going more than 1.25 sacks, right? Because remember, the NFL does half sacks. Mm-hmm. More than 1.25 sacks for Chris Jones plus George Karloftis. More than 1.25. So that's for tomorrow night's game, Broncos and Chiefs with our friends over at Prize Picks. And you could do the same thing. Right? How does it work? You pick two to five players. If they score more or less than their prize picks projection, that's what you're trying to select. You can win up to 10 times your money on any entry. There's no competing against other people. It's just you versus the projections available. Prize picks offers projections on any sport that you watch. This includes NFL, NBA, MLB, NHL, PGA, college football, men's college basketball, women's college basketball, soccer, WNBA, esports, NASCAR, tennis, MMA, boxing, disc golf, Euro basketball, cricket, and more. There's actually more. So entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. It's safe and fast withdrawals, currently operational in over 30 states plus Canada. So download the PrizePix app or go to prizepix.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First-time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code PFF1. So if you deposit $100, PrizePix will give you $100. If you deposit $50, PrizePix will give you $50. Don't forget to enter promo code PFF1 at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. And here at PFF are... Picks of the week will be looking at Javante Williams and Rasheed Rice. More than half touchdown. Chris Jones, George Kaloftis, more than 1.25 sacks. All right, man. What else we got here for today's show? Discord question of the week. Uh, This one's from Philip in the Discord. Uh, After five weeks, we've all seen enough football to change our priors to some extent. It's still early, and injuries will undoubtedly be a factor, as we're seeing this week. Uh, But I'd be interested to hear Sam and Steve's thoughts on the following. Number one. Who are the serious Super Bowl contenders? Number two, what teams are surprises so far? Number three, what teams with bad records are the most screwed? And number four, which teams with bad records or underwhelming play do we think can turn things around and be serious playoff teams? So you want to take those one by one? One by one. Let's go um, real Super Bowl contenders. Yeah. We don't need a team each for this one. This one we can actually – I mean, obviously the 49ers and the Eagles, the two undefeated teams. Two teams in the NFC. I'm, is there anyone else from the NFC you would throw in there? Five days ago, I would have said the Cowboys. Right. I, I might be out. Might be out? On the Cowboys. I still think they are. I am, however, starting to think that they do need to avoid San Francisco in the playoffs for that to be a thing. True. Like, like if They, just they don't, could probably compete with Philly. Yeah, like if the Eagles knock off the 49ers and Dallas just has to go through Philly, I, I could see that. Which is unlikely given the seeding potential, but who knows. But yeah. Philly's got a very difficult schedule, as I mentioned, coming There's up. There's so. probably not anyone. I mean, Detroit? Are they Detroit, a Super Bowl I contender? Think I, I'm more – Detroit's in the mix. Now, the interesting thing about Detroit 
is the thing I'm going to give them credit for is waxing bad teams, mm -hmm. which is exactly what Dallas does. Sure. Right. So we're looking at Dallas and say they wax bad teams. They they crush teams and then they lose the games that are supposed to put them over the hump. Detroit did beat Kansas City in Week One, so that would be that's their signature win. Say a Kelsey less. It was Kelsey less. It was by one. I mean there was a there was a fluke pick six. Want to see a little bit more from Detroit, but they're trending in that direction. Yeah. Tampa Bay. They play Tampa Bay this week. I'm not ready to put Tampa Bay there just because they're no. three and one. Um, can we, by the way, can we as a society? <laughs> Can we push back on power rankings? And I'm not going to name names for the people that put out their power rankings yeah. that are legitimately just the standings. <laughs> it's like, like it's the standings, and then like if the Chiefs lost a game they shouldn't have won, we'll just bump them up a little bit. Like an NFL. My power rankings: uh, Niners five and zero, four uh, Eagles five and zero, and then all the four and one teams, then the three and one teams, then the three and two teams, then the two and three teams. Those are not power rankings; they're standings. Like we go to NFL.com and the default is by division, but you can actually sort it by league, like the entire NFL. That's, that's the power rankings for most they people. Yeah. They literally just put the standings up there. Like the, people probably dropped the Bills nine spots because they just lost in their three and two, even though the Bills are still probably a top five team in the NFL. Right? Nothing. They're still a very good team. Great team. Buffalo Bills. But they lost. Mm -hmm. Drop them. All right. Anyway. I, I mean, I think contenders. as of five weeks, Detroit are contenders like actual contenders. They've shown they'll get to the playoffs, they'll win their division, and they, are, they have enough to scare teams. I mean, Jared Goff's playing fantastically. That offense is nasty. The defense is playing really well. I think, yeah, let's give them, let's throw them in there. So four contenders in the NFC. AFC. I might have a question to add to the show here. There was a text from a friend. Okay. He doesn't even know we're live. We'll add it after this. So AFC-wise. Kansas City, obviously. Yeah. Uh, Miami. Miami's in it. Yeah. Even though they Super Bowl got contender. fairly well stomped by Buffalo. Yeah. They got another game in Miami. Are Buffalo in it? Even yeah. Though they've lost Buffalo's two still games. in it. Yeah. I don't care if they've lost. Okay. Who else? Buffalo's still in it. Um, that might be it. That's I it? think the Chargers still have that potential. Ravens. The Ravens and Chargers still have that potential. Um, the Ravens, I don't know. There's something missing there. And it might just be, you know, they play the Steelers. They've lost two ridiculous heartbreakers right overtime to the Colts and then this game against the Steelers but the Ravens are still a capable team that can go on a run so I think the Ravens are in the mix and I, I still want to see more from the Chargers we've seen teams that have atrocious defenses turn things around in weeks five six and seven before they're they're too talented to play as poorly as they did on defense the first couple of weeks the Chargers this could be the year I think the Chargers actually beat the Chiefs in a game, in a, in a one-game setting, which might spring some life that the Chargers can also go on a playoff run. All right. Surprises. Who's your surprise team? Just pick one. Oh, and each. the Jacks, too. Um, <coughs> the Bucks are the surprise team for me. The Bucks. Yeah. They're 3-1 they're and one through four weeks. I don't think the schedule's been ridiculously difficult, but they got Baker Mayfield playing the best ball he's played in four years, and the defense is still solid. I'm surprised that the Bucks are sitting here at 3-1 and one going up against the 4-1 Lions this week. Mm -hmm. uh, my surprise the Bucks would be a good one I think it might actually be Arizona I know they've only won one game but it's the fact that they're actually number one the game was against Dallas yeah. uh, and number two they are not easy to put away for anybody when you look at who they've actually played it's not like they've had the easiest schedule in the world and every one of those games has been competitive they went down in a hole against San Francisco and battled back to make that a tight game before they got away from them again. Same thing against Cincinnati. Like, they are fighting good teams hard all the way. That's surprising to me. I thought they would just be, like, absolute lame ducks all the way through the Arizona's season. a good one. Arizona's definitely a good one. Uh, okay, uh, bad records that are the most screwed. Um, Giants. The Giants. The, the, Gi the Giants were a playoff team last year that not only did they play they played above their skis last year we expected some regression but it's not just record regression the team has regressed like everything's worse yeah with the giants and they have a it just may historically bad offensive line situation right now <laughs> it's just been rough the most bone team is quite clearly the carolina panthers they are own five they don't own the pick that they are marching inevitably towards and there is talk of you know, all of a sudden we're hearing about, I mean, I kind of wanted Stroud, and the owner steps in, you know? And it's, it's so 
Frank Reich is out here sort of saying, look, there's various different models with owners, and my owner likes to be involved, and, you know, these that are good conversations. It. No, we, we, were, we we're jumping to some conclusions. The jump to conclusions, Matt, is, is laid out here, and you're jumping. Yeah, I'm jumping. So that was not necessarily in reference to draft meetings. No. That was it, a general statement it, about you the interaction. That, but you join that dot to with the owner. previous dot of No, Brad video. did. I saw Brad did. I saw Brad jump to that conclusion. Or Spielberg. Brad was like, "Oh, this the means, only person." I mean, most this means that around. I wanted Stroud. Two, two it plus two. Quite literally, could mean we're sitting here in week three. We're zero and three. I have to have a meeting with the owner. That's an uncomfortable thing. I have to explain why we're zero and three. Why we're losing games. No, no, no. I mean, he's talking about this being a general trend with this owner, and whether or not it's connected to the quarterback. The point being. Uh, hit, this is an ownership model where the owner likes to be heavily involved in the process, right? And, you know, as much as I respect that as a billionaire from, the, from that mindset, you know, wanting to play real-life fantasy football, I think generally speaking it's a bad thing for the correct football decision winning out. And when you join that dot with the dot of Josh uh, McCown like <laughs> literally – looking like he was about to adopt C.J. Stroud and talking about, like, hooking him up with a basketball court in Carolina or whatever, and then, uh uh-oh, no, we picked Bryce Young. The dots are not in it. They're not headed in a positive direction. You know, you join the dots, and it ultimately leads to a picture. That's the idea of that. The picture that that is creating for Carolina is not good. I want to not try to connect any of those dots. I didn't try to do it before the draft. I did not look into the handshake that Josh McCown gave C.J. Stroud at the time. You should have looked into it. And I'm refusing to look into it now. No. Anyway, I'm just yeah, saying. Yeah, the Panthers look screwed, no talent. but not because Frank Reich had a press conference where he said, I have uncomfortable meetings with the owner who likes to have an opinion. They have no talent, no draft pick that they're headed towards to try and fix the talent, yeah. and potentially they have a meddling owner, which could be causing problems. That... I can agree with. And that's as boned as it gets. Uh, last one, which teams have bad records or underwhelming play can turn around and be ser- serious playoff team? I mean, the, to me, the most obvious one's the Bengals. Yeah. They've done it before. There's a previous, there's a previous track record there. Uh, the are they the only team that could make the playoffs from a losing point? I think they probably – well, the Titans, I guess, could. The Titans and the Texans are both interesting teams. I think – you could you could say that the Titans are better than their two and three record would indicate, but they're but at the end of the day, the Texans and Titans might look like similar teams. Yeah, you know, they're just those they're just not there yet. Those I think are the, the only teams with a losing record that I think could even make the playoffs. Texans, Titans, Texans, Titans, and Bengals, and Bengals. I mean, the Bengals clearly because. I guess, I mean... They're the, playing below their previous yeah, baseline. The Packers maybe could sneak a wild card spot from somewhere, and the Commanders the same thing, but not really. Packers are on a, they're on a downswing right now. They're also, I mean, they had a 17-point fourth quarter comeback right. against the Saints away from being 1-4, and and four, which you'll give them credit for, but it's, you know, they're treading a fine line in Green Bay right now. Theoretically, the Jets' defense is nasty enough that they could sneak a wild card spot, but I doubt it. All right, that's that one done. Uh, so we've had this question come in in a bunch of different ways and uh, everywhere, essentially. But with the Texans actually looking better than they were, than we thought they would be heading into the season, the Will Anderson trade looks better now than it did at draft time. Um, can they actually achieve a low enough draft pick that the narrative changes in that trade and it becomes potentially worth doing? Um, so the actual... So the way you would stack it up on a balance sheet, you would say, where did they trade up from, 12 or 11? Uh, so you'd have 12, to... I think, right? This, uh, is, this is where it's a challenge, right? So you would say, they traded up from, say, 12. So what they gave up was pick 12 mm-hmm. itself. Which is the important part. Like, it's not just this pick that they gave up. Right. So it's, it's pick 12. It was pick 33 or 34 as well, right? So an early second rounder. In, the, in last year, in the 2023 20, draft, and then next year's first rounder. I mean, even if next year's first rounder is pick 20, like even if they make the playoffs and it's pick 24 right. or 25, you're still stacking the value of three players against Anderson. I know there was a third rounder mixed in there as well, but it's basically, basically three players, right? So who could they have had 2023 NFL draft? Who was picked after pick – was it pick 12, yeah. by the way? Um. So anybody that they could have had at pick 12. And when you play this game, it's very easy to say, well, they could have had 
the best player that we know, which is Christian, Christian Gonzalez could have been pick 12 for them. They could have had Christian Gonzalez. They also could have had Lucas Van Ness. What was the second rounder they gave up? I think it was in the 30s. It was, uh, the set, yeah, from Houston, uh, pick 33, where 33. Will Levis went. So they could have had, like a worst case scenario is Sam Laporta went the pick after the pick where they, that they traded. So interesting. Christian Gonzalez went a couple picks after the right. first one that they traded. And then next year's, say it's pick 25. And by all accounts, it looks like next year's draft looks way stronger than this year's draft. Right. And pick 25 looks like a good player. The, the Jimmy Johnson trade value chart thing, like there's a lot of flaws to that. It's outdated, whatever, but it's a rule of thumb that a lot of NFL teams still cling to. If you paint that exact scenario that you just laid out, right? Pick number 12, pick number 24 uh, as a playoff spot, and then whatever that was, 36, did you say? That actually puts them, or 33, that almost, that puts them almost exactly what number three overall is worth. So if just from a simple accountancy Jimmy Johnson trade value thing, it actually gets pretty close if that's the scenario we're painting, but... That doesn't factor in. Number one, it's wrong. I mean, like the value is yeah. off in the Jimmy Johnson chart. But uh, number two, the point that that doesn't factor in is that's three players versus yeah. one. And look, again, I love Will Anderson. I mean, Will Anderson has been – he's been pretty good so far. Mm -hmm. He hasn't uh, – probably a similar start to, say, Aiden Hutchinson. And last year, Hutchinson really flipped a switch in week seven or eight, nine, whatever it was, and became the player that he is right now, which is you know, leading the league in pressures. I think Anderson has that type of potential and, and could be that guy. But it depends on how you look at this, right? You could say, well, Emmanuel Forbes went a few picks. Uh, you know, they could have picked Emmanuel Forbes, and that would have been a, a bad pick. They could have picked, you know, who, uh, who else was available? Or, um, Derek Hall that Seattle picked, or Matthew Bergeron. And so they could have made bad picks mm -hmm. with those picks. But in a vacuum, it's still going to be a challenge for Will Anderson to equal the value of – what they would have gotten last year at pick 12, pick 33, and next year's pick, no matter where it lands in the first round, it's still going to be challenging. Now, is it not as drastic as giving up Marvin Harrison Jr.? Yeah, it's probably not going to be as drastic as what we talked about at draft time for sure. Mm -hmm. I concur. Do you have a, an ad read to go, or are we jumping straight into the next, the next question? I'll do an ad read, and then I want to answer a question from, uh, from a friend. Okay. That, uh, that maybe you can help answer. Our next partner is AG1, the daily foundational nutrition supplement that supports whole body health. I got my voice almost all the way back. I credit AG1. Almost. Thank you, guys. Almost there. We drink it every day, right? You just kick it off with, uh, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. In the middle of the read. Yeah. Google, where I'm reading, decided you need to log in again. Huh. Yeah. It's all right, though. I got my AG1. I'm powering through it. So I drink it every single day, get all my nutrients, kick it off with my coffee, just mix it with some water, chug it down, and I'm good to go for the day. Just like great athletes, you know, you got to have those, uh, those daily habits. That's why I'm in on that. 75 high-quality ingredients that give me everything I need to support energy, focus, strength, and clarity. It's this micro habit that, that delivers macro benefits and helps pretty much anybody, whether you are a great athlete or a podcaster, whatever it is. This will help you. I love that it costs less than $3 a day, too. Really good deal to get high-quality sourced ingredients. It's a win-win for all of us. So if a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first, pur first purchase. So go to drinkag1.com slash PFF. That's drinkag1.com slash PFF. Go check it out right now. All right, friend from former Major League pitcher Mike Koploff. Okay. I think he may have pitched in the World Series yeah. for the Arizona Diamondbacks. He's uh, from Philadelphia, big Eagles fan. Right. And in the middle of the podcast, he texted me. So I figured it was good to just read it out. Sure. He says, so how good is Jalen Carter? How excited do I need to be? Uh -huh. um, Mike and I were uh, on the same team in AAA back in 2010. And we were in the bullpen during the draft that year. And I was in the bullpen in Colorado Springs with my phone. I brought my phone to the bullpen that day just so I could keep up with the draft. And that was the year that the Eagles drafted Brandon Graham. And I, I remember trying to assure Mike at the time that Brandon Graham, an unheralded pass rusher from Michigan, was a good pick for the Eagles. And so every year after that, he kept asking me, what about Brandon Graham? What about Graham? And they you know, he ended up being pretty good. You did. So that was uh, Mike and I, our history, talking Eagles. He wants to know how excited should they be about Jalen Carter? Uh, very excited. I mean, 
I, I tweeted last night that Jalen Carter is the number one interior rusher in the NFL in terms of pass rush win rate, 20.9%. Number two is Aaron Donald. Number three, Javon Hargrave. Number four, Chris Jones. Like this is a pretty high level list to be on. And Jalen Carter would actually crack the top 10 in terms of edge rushers. Like he would be crazy in the top 10 of pass rush win rate just from edges who get more pressure than those interior guys. He looks like a dominant force. I mean, they were, he was starting to get the Aaron Donald double team treatment against the Rams, and he was just wrecking the double teams. Like they were, he was splitting double teams. He was sequentially knocking one guy and then the other over and getting into the backfield. He's been amazing. I mean, he's got, is he the best graded interior guy in the NFL right now? He's, he looks as good as anybody. And, I mean, I, I, th- I can't remember if I said this on the show or if I was just creating the article, but through four games, he had the best start we've ever seen from an interior player. And the second best start was Aaron Donald back when he came in. So all of the evidence right now suggests that Jalen Carter isn't just good, but is maybe the best interior rusher we've seen come into the league. Now, Donald got a hell of a lot better from his start to where he ended up. So that doesn't mean he'll be better than Donald, you know, in a year, in two years. But the start we've seen is basically as good as anybody that's come into the league since, like, 2006. Yeah, we, I wouldn't put the Donald comp on anyone because of how long he dominated, the sustained yeah. success. And how good he got. I mean, you know, Donald was good right out of the gate, but he was really good against the run straight away. <clears throat> and he went from, like, his, his rookie grade as a pass rusher was 77.8, which is very good, yeah. right? But then that went to 93.1 and stayed above 92 for, like, every season of his right. career. So, um, it, but even if you just say Jalen Carter can be a Chris Jones-like force, that's good enough. I mean, that's good enough to be excited, and I think that's absolutely reasonable. I mean, you there's a picture you could paint that's in between Chris Jones and Aaron Donald, right? That maybe yeah. he's And that's even, I mean, there. even if he just... The Chris Jones trajectory is probably a more reasonable one than the Aaron Donald one. Like, Jones was good pretty much right away. And then slowly and steadily, he went from being good to being one of the best non-Aaron Donald players in the NFL at that position to actually last year, he got where Aaron Donald was, more or less, maybe just below him. But Carter could – maybe that's the high watermark for Chris Jones, right? And he goes back to being somewhere between Aaron Donald and the best non-Aaron Donald players. But – Carter, I don't see any reason why he can't do that. And this is all with the caveat of if they can keep him together. Yeah. You know, like he, he's got multiple sort of maturity concern type things off the field in his past. And this is why he slipped to where he was. Like nobody was, nobody thought Jalen Carter wasn't a dominant player when they watched his tape, but it was like the dude on the day of the combine has an issue, uh, an arrest issued for or, or a warrant issued for his arrest stemming from an incident of you know street racing that ends up with people dying like these are things that that were pretty big red flags the, the one thing i'm interested in from just an on-field perspective is he never played a ton of snaps at georgia he has not played more than 40 snaps in a game so far this year the one like if there's an underrated part of aaron donald's game it's the fact that he played over a thousand snaps every year. He was up and around a right. thousand snaps as an as a defensive tackle, which is absurd. And even you know Chris Jones plays 55, 60 snaps in a lot of games. At some point, upping the workload for yeah. Carter, that's the thing that puts him in that top echelon. Right now, the fact that his pass rush win rate and grade are in the same conversation as Donald and Jones and others around the league, that's incredible. So mm-hmm. great start for Jalen. But this is part of the benefit of going to Philadelphia, right, is that they don't necessarily need him to play a thousand snaps. Um, He's already playing more on a per game basis than he played at Georgia at ever at any point because they had such a crazy D-line rotation that everybody played like 350 snaps. So he's already playing more than that on a per game basis. Um, He's definitely below the other guys, but I would imagine that in an ideal world, Philadelphia want to scale up how much they're using him, but not to the Donald level. Like they would want him playing fewer snaps than that generally so there you go mike gave you your answer yeah Koplov. done is he a big name do you he's um he's not a huge i've never heard of him but that doesn't mean anything no i mean he's he was a relief pitcher for let me see how many major league he's a scout now okay for the phillies i believe but i think he's with the phillies he's got 250 major league innings played in 222 games 
He was on the 01 Arizona team that uh, won the World Series. No. Oh. So he's probably got a ring. Got a ring. Um, he is most the most popular play. I think I mentioned this to you before on the podcast. There's a play historically where there's like a fly ball and the base runner makes one of like the worst base running plays in history. Like he runs all the way to third and then thinks he has to go back because it was caught. He's running back and forth backwards on the bases and everything and then eventually scores because the defense is worse than the base running. <laughs> and Mike was on the mound. Coppola was the pitcher. And there's like a picture of him with like his hands just on his head. standing there watching the shit yeah. show. He's like backing up third base right. just like, oh, what are we doing? Um, so that's somewhere out there in the ether. That's probably the most famous thing Nice for him. All right. We're on to the next uh, mailbag. Is it GM time or is it? No, one more before the GM time. This one was just funny. I, I'm going to just pitch this to you as a concept and see where you want to see what you think of it. Um, this is an email came in from somebody. The man's Swedish, right? So there's always a debate as to how you pronounce this kind of thing, right? I actually looked up how Swedes treat J's in is the this language. Jonas? Yeah, which is, I think, it's not quite Jonas. There's, there's a kind of weird sound attached to the J's that are there to make them slightly differently. So it's sort of like Jonas Lejean, right? Something like that. There's yeah. some sort of weird guttural common common email here. to the J. Anyway, he had a big thing that was essentially saying, um, you know, there's these tenets of what you shouldn't do. Never trade for a player that Bill Belichick wants to get rid of, right? Never trade with Harry Roseman, period. Uh, <laughs> and now he thinks you should never, you know, acquire a Steelers wide receiver that's worn out as welcome in Pittsburgh because Antonio Brown, Chase Claypool, Santonio Holmes, Mike Wallace, it's always bad once they leave, right? And the narrative from everywhere else is Mike Tomlin must be some sort of genius at holding these guys together, you know, long enough while they're in Pittsburgh and then eventually just goes, all right, I'm done. Fat enough, get rid of him. Someone else's problem. Yeah, and then once they leave the Mike Tomlin environment, they un unspool. However, Jonas has a, an alternate theory. Uh, maybe Mike Tomlin is simply a wide receiver succubus. Think about it. The Steelers keep drafting wide receivers, and for all we know, they're perfectly upstanding young men and prior to their uh, and pride to their society. And then Tomlin gets his claws into them, and once he's done with them, uh, he has turned them their upstandery turns into ass hattery and lunacy and that uh, that he then flips for a draft pick so it's, it's actually tom so actually fault. tomlin is like the vampire leech that's I draining see. these I wide see. receivers he's like turning them all into cia operatives uh, yeah uh, whatever and by the time they leave they're just he's some kind of wide receiver parasite that camp. leeches like the good upstanding nature I of see. these young men and then once he's turned them into a so they've like a horrible husk Jonas of a human. Jonas flipped this whole right. thing. Right. He drop kicks him out and sends him somewhere else. What do you think? That's yeah, possible. Yeah? <laughs> Is it likely? <laughs> possible, not likely. Possible, not likely. Possible, okay. not likely. So the more likely Don't hate that in this Hanlon's razor dynamic we've got here, the yeah. more likely thing is that Tomlin is actually very good at holding problem people together and then right. eventually tires of it. As opposed to Tomlin is creating the problem children himself. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of theories, um, our friend uh, Andrew Siciliano, Sicily. I, I don't know if he realized, Sicily, I don't know if he understands the ginger theory and everything, but I when doubt. the Niners-Cowboys game got out of hand, it was Cooper Rush versus Sam Darnold. That's true. Which was an amazing battle. And uh, there's just there's not enough ginger going around. I think Dalton stole it back in week three. He had, a, he had the best game any Panthers quarterback had all game, all, all season. But ginger theory's dead because nobody's got a starting job. Uh, Wentz, Dalton, Darnold. Yeah, I mean, there's no, there's no, there's no ginger. There a ginger in college? No ginger playing. Anyone in college ready to come out that's balling out? Is there a ginger in college that has stolen the All power? of the talent. Yeah. All right. Now it's GM time. So you got to shuffle your way over there to your GM podium. Well, I'm waiting for Tyler to shuffle his way back to get the graphic. No, I think he's good. I think he's good. There's somebody else in there as well. You're fine. Sorry. Got it. Look at that. Beautiful. GM palette. You're putting on a bit of a paunch there in the, uh, in the picture. Not, not you there. I, you're fine. Just in the, the Photoshop image we've got here. Yeah. It's a bit of a paunch. I'm here. I'm ready to face the press. Let's cool. Um, so this question I'm going to modify slightly. Can I answer the way James Franklin answered yesterday? That was amazing. Just told the guy his question's yeah. idiotic? Yeah. My skin is crawling with how bad your question is. It was a terrible question. It was. Um, <laughs> hard no. <laughs> hard no. <laughs> so I wanted to read this email. In, I want to modify it slightly for a GM question, right? But I wanted to get it in because uh, I needed to read the opening paragraph. 
Great. Which is good afternoon, Sam and Steve. Uh, and it's not quite afternoon, but I, I appreciate it anyway. I'm going to go by the name my friends know me as, Slurpee, because I'm not supposed to be listening to podcasts at work. And on the off chance this gets read out on the episode, I don't need to get in trouble. So this is from Slurpee. Apparently. Absolutely. Not, not anyone else. Uh, first, he loves our two-hour-long episodes because they make his day go faster. And this, of all pods he listens to, is his favorite. Now, while he's listening, potentially risking getting fired just to listen to the podcast, yeah. send that man a subscription. That's from great. Slurpee. Yeah. Slurpee. Which is a slightly strange name for anybody to know him by, and I'm, I'm vaguely curious. Um, vaguely. It's like, his favorite drink. Depending on the answer, change. No, because it's spelled with an E. And I'm only assuming that's pronounced Slurpee because okay, I can't okay. think of a different way it would be pronounced. Fair. Anyway, uh, his question is essentially about Sam Howell and how, uh, you know, when you were talking, you rewind a bit. Sam Howell at one point was supposed to go number one overall in the draft and didn't. It stayed in college, uh, had, had not a great year, slipped in the draft all the way to the fifth round. And now you fast forward and, you know, up and down as his season has been, he's potentially the best quarterback in that draft class. Like it's him or Kenny Pickett, right, at the moment. Um, we've talked about it being important uh, that... Excuse me, really quick. Uh, Brock Purdy. Oh, he's that same draft class? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, then he's not. Um, but could be second. Yes, the second best quarterback in that draft class. Uh, so we've talked about it being important that we see high-end play from corners more important than um, that we see it the most recent thing that, that they did, right? So uh, the Derek Stingley idea. The, the more important part was that we saw elite play from Derek Stingley than it, ha- than it was it was the most recent season. Now, the Derek Stingley thing is not working out that well so far, but that being said, um, he effectively asks GM, consultant GM Palazzolo, should teams be looking at quarterbacks the same way and, you know, taking them high or believing in them if we have seen this high-end play from them regardless of the fact that they then regressed in their final season in college? It's a great question. And Sam, you and I discuss this every time we're evaluating draft prospects. And we do sometimes on the podcast here. What do you do with the guy whose peak season was not his last season? What do you do with that guy? I think it varies by position. Uh, my, my short answer is I'm going to study this. Uh, <laughs> so not, I, I ref, I'm not going to be the person. I'm not going to be Bill Poley and saying, I, had, I wanted to pick Tom Brady in the first round. I knew that back in 2000. But I'm going to use a Brock Purdy example. Brock Purdy had a 90-plus PFF grade as a freshman. There was a point where Brock Purdy, you, you look at that freshman year, and you could say, this guy with his, you know, he doesn't have the best tools and arm and this and that, like should be in this conversation to get drafted pretty high in a couple of years. And then his grade just continued to get worse, and I think he leveled. He was like high 70s for the next three years and became an afterthought. It was like, all right, he just peaked as a freshman. So you could actually throw Brock Purdy into that conversation, guy that had a peak season. The other end of the spectrum is a guy like Drew Locke, who started out so bad as a freshman and got incrementally better as a sophomore, junior in his last year, maybe 88 PFF grade, whatever that was, but he had a peak season. Patrick Mahomes had a peak 90-ish type of season. You know, So there are examples of the peak, and I think it's worth studying. I don't have a clean answer yet, but... I think it's one of the challenges of evaluating is saying, you know, scouts always say like uh, traits. It's all about traits. So if you thought a player had the traits, which theoretically don't change because they're traits, that's why you buy into them. If you thought he had the traits before his senior year and he has a bad senior year, what changed? The traits didn't change because theoretically they're supposed to be static, right? That's why you buy into them as a scout. So it's kind of like this double speak that doesn't make a ton of sense. Um, so either have traits or you don't. Um, I think the production thing is similar, right? If, if you do have that peak level of play, yeah, maybe there's something to lean into there. Howell's an interesting case because his play got worse very specifically because he lost three really good wide receivers who went to the NFL and he, you know, they, they ran him more and changed the offense and he still had success in different ways. So I don't have a clean answer for that at the moment as GM, but I think it's worth investigating I've done a little work on it, but peak years versus sustained success. And I venture to think that it's going to be different across certain positions. And even the more interesting one to me is not necessarily the guys that had sustained success, you know, year on year, sort of every year was good, but 
it, it feels better, that incremental step up thing, the Drew Lock thing you described, where it's like it goes from, you know, bad to below average to above average to great. That feels like a nice development curve. Your brain is happy with that dynamic, right? Like, well, the guy's getting better every year. This is coachable. This is think how good he'll be in three years' time, right? Right. Um, but actually, if you just take those four years and randomize them, the important thing is the best year. Like that. That's an interesting. That's what I concept. want to test. How a, a player's best year. And and again, I, there's it's a very it's a difficult challenge to use data to point to high hit rates at quarterback for various reasons. But the, here's the other examples. Justin Herbert, much like Brock Purdy, highest graded PFF grade was as a freshman. Justin Herbert was locked in as the future number one overall pick for a few years until he just didn't improve. Uh, jo- on the other hand, Josh Rosen, and I don't have his grades handy, Sam, I think he was like a low 80s grade he never Pretty got any much better. every year. Yeah, he never got any better from his he freshman He didn't improve. Year. Now, he didn't peak as a freshman necessarily, but perception-wise he did. Yeah. And then he never really got better. So again, that's where, like, the data might – I could pull this Justin Herbert example out and be like, yeah, I do that. Brock Purdy, yeah, I do that. But then Josh Rosen might say the opposite. And Sam Darnold's second to last year, I think, was more impressive than his final season. So there are examples on both ends. Um, and so the challenge with using data – to point to quarterbacks is we care about a top eight quarterback. We care about the elite quarterbacks. And there's really only three or four that have come out in the last 10 years. So there's never going to be data that supports that. Now, data that supports starters, I think we can get there. So it, it, it is a, an interesting question. The, uh, I made the mistake again of wearing green on the green screen show, but it's slightly less, it's, uh, it's a lighter green or a more tealy green so it doesn't go full I love uh, it. NFL backdrop like the way it did with, with the Ireland jersey but it's still it adds a nice little uh, logo dapple to this jersey I like it I think we're done now you can haul your right, back, back to the seat thank you for your question you're welcome um, it wasn't as dumb <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't make your skin crawl the way it did James Franklin we should play that audio that's worth it it is pretty amazing <sighs> See how many shows I can go to say uh, in a row where I say it's so tough to use data to predict quarterbacks. Yeah. Just because, like, nobody wants, nobody cares if you just project a starter. Right. Like, nobody just wants a starter. Well, also, you yeah. You do want starters at other positions, right? If you, can, if you have data that says, I will give you a 60% hit rate to find a starting tackle, a starting edge, that is a good thing. That is a win. If I tell you I can give you a 60% hit rate to find a starting quarterback, well, great. Like Teddy Bridgewater was a starting quarterback. And nobody's being like, man, you got to get Teddy at the building. Need that guy. After t- over time, right? right? You found out, okay, he's a, he's a good start. He's a fine starter, but we need better. Yeah, well, That's the challenge with quarterback. There's that working for it um, that you're actually, unlike most other positions, you're only really interested in superstar. And anything short of that isn't going to cut it and by definition like anything targeting that is going to be a low hit rate because almost nobody is a superstar so that's working against you the other problem is we can't even agree how much outside influences affect quarterback play you know and you don't need to go any further than look at Brock Purdy the discussion the dynamic right now right we range all the way on the Brock Purdy discussion from he's MVP look at the numbers they speak for themselves I don't need to see any more to like, okay, this is, this is the other end of the spectrum, and it is definitely the outlier, but, like, nobody, I think, is lower on Brock Purdy still than Stephen Ruiz from The Ringer, who does these quarterback rankings. Now, Stephen Ruiz, a week one, started off, Brock Purdy was 32nd in the NFL. He was the lowest-ranked starting quarterback. I assume he just ranked 1-32. to 32. I haven't opened them. But he essentially said, worst starting quarterback in the league coming into the year. Now, over five, six weeks, he's up that to the 22nd ranked. But the point being, like, MVP, 22nd ranked in the NFL. And the only difference here is how much influence is Kyle Shanahan, Brandon Ayuk, George Kittle, Debo Samuel, Christian McCaffrey, all of that having on this one dude. We can't agree. We don't know how much that is. So when you're looking at a guy in college, you, can't, you don't even know how much of his performance is him and how much of it is everything else. Yeah. And look, we wouldn't have that discussion. It, we're, like People aren't having that Brock Purdy's not really the MVP discussion because they don't like Brock Purdy or because he doesn't have a good arm. Like Nobody's doing it because he doesn't throw fast enough. 
I think they're really doing it because there's just other data available historically. We did this with Nick Foles years ago. Nick Foles, 2013, right. where he had 27 touchdowns and two picks in a seven-touchdown game. He stepped into a system where Chip Kelly was great for a year, and the NFL didn't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And the PFF grade was about a 78, and the passer rating and the EPA and all the production numbers, which are more driven by the team, were really high. And so to me, I was like the PFF grade, I mean, I'm a biased, but I know how the PFF grade works. And we have this history of saying a guy can have an 80 grade with MVP caliber stats. A guy can also have an 80 grade with average to below average stats. So clearly, and, and I believe we're the consistent ones there, right? I believe the grade is the consistent thing there. So there's just like the, the anti-Brock Purdy thing is people have seen this before. There's a history of Kyle Shanahan doing this. There's also a history of teams that have that level, level of playmaker making their quarterback stats look better. You have both in San Francisco, right? This is also the first year the Niners have been completely healthy at playmaker. You know, I'm just calling it playmaker now, a tight end receiver and running back and hybrids. And you know the other underrated part of stats that we don't look at enough, Sam? Is we sometimes we look at drop rate to defend a quarterback and say, "Oh man, he's he's making good throws," but his guys are dropping him. The where's a uh, drop rate for this year? I think Brock Purdy's receivers have dropped nothing. Do they even have any drops? That's not too bad. Four. That's not too bad. But just like not dropping passes, just catching the stuff that's there, also makes. Makes the stats look pretty good overall. So, look, Brock Purdy, 78 PFF grade, I think is correct. I think that's good. He's elevating that offense. And he deserves a ton of credit for making that offense look better. The highest end Shanahan offense since 2016, the Matt Ryan year. Now it's a question of you're always trying to split up credit, and it's challenging. Yeah, we've also, like – you know, the shouty show world we live in where the time span in everybody's brain, everybody has been reduced to having the brain of a goldfish, right? Except instead of four seconds or whatever the goldfish is supposed to remember, it's a week. You remember one week and that's it. Then everything resets and now you, you have new information and your brain only goes back a week. So we've done this before, right? Baker Mayfield set rookie records for the Browns. Baker Mayfield rescued the Browns as a rookie. He was finally the answer. And then the Baker Mayfield thing stopped working, right? Because everything around him changed. It went up, it went down, it went everywhere. And now Baker Mayfield is like a journeyman who's sort of resuscitating his career in Tampa Bay. After, like, Carson Wentz was seen as the best quarterback in the NFL for like a season and a half entering his, rookie, entering his career. You can say injuries ruined him, but there were a lot of people saying this is unsustainably wild. It's not happening anyway. Like, it's all built off crazy high leverage, third and long plays. The grade never quite matched uh, where Wentz's perception was. And even when it did, it was screaming regression at every point, right? Um, you know, 2017 Case Keenum. Was anybody coming out of that year going, Case Keenum's the truth? He's, we've just, he's been miscast in every offense so far. I don't know why it took this long for Case Keenum to have a breakout year like this. We knew it was going to come back down to earth. Like, this has happened time after time after time. And yet, there's also examples of Josh Allen happened, right? Two yeah. years worth of pretty crappy Josh Allen play. And people were saying, give it time, it's going to come good. And now Josh Allen has come good, and he's become this amazing player. So... The Brock Purdy thing, I, the, the more important part in all this is not like how much is him, how much of it is everything else. It's that actually he's getting better, and whatever that percentage is, he's claiming a bigger piece of it in the last couple of weeks. And if that trend continues, like that's scary for the rest of the NFL because if Brock Purdy is actually able to overcome everything around him, if a team ever figures out answers for that, that's, that's a problem for every other team in the NFL. Oh, man, not to... The, the game Sunday night, too, by the way, when we use the term upside, I, I pushed back on it for years until you saw the high upside guys actually hit, right? For years, we would say, why, why do you just say that the guy who throws the ball fast has upside? And then Josh Allen and Justin Herbert and Lamar and uh, Mahomes and a lot of these guys started to hit their ceiling based off of tools. And it's like, okay, we've gone through this stretch. But I also, I used to have this take that I've softened that a guy like a Purdy, uh, upside includes just working the system better. Mm -hmm. 
So Brock Purdy doesn't have arm talent upside, but it, it is fair to say he's run Shanahan's system great. And then you see the other night where he runs it even better. The anticipation and like anticipation is also upside as well yeah. because you'll do it more often. And so it's a different type of upside that maybe Brock Purdy has right now, which I think is your point. Like he's continuing to get better. Not just that, but here's the extra, the extra layer of complication as if it needed to be even more complicated, right? Number one, you've got the baseline of how much is him, what percentage. I, I always think of it as a pie chart, right? How much of the pie chart for credit for a success is Brock Purdy, Kyle Shanahan, each individual receiver, the run game, the offensive line. There's like seven things that get thrown in, thrown in there. Each one of them has some portion of that pie, and we don't know how big it is, right? So that's like your starting point. How, how big a piece of that pie does Brock Purdy deserve versus Shanahan and everything else? Then you get this extra thing, which is where I think the Purdy dynamic is actually really interesting, is I think he is better in this offense than almost any other quarterback who suffers a – or who uh, – benefits from a similar boost from Kyle Shanahan because Shanahan's piece of that pie is pretty big. But what you don't understand, and there are, there's just no way of measuring this, but is, is a thing, is what happens when Shanahan starts to change the way he behaves and the way he calls the game and the way he goes for certain situations or not, the way he addresses certain situations because he has more faith in Brock Purdy than somebody else, right? And this is where, like, that's not just a Shanahan thing. That's not just a Purdy thing. That's a combination of both. And it's why I think the the combination of Purdy and Shanahan and everything else is actually more powerful than simply the 100% of that pie chart, right? It becomes 120% somewhere because now Shanahan is looking at this and going, dude, Brock Purdy's different. I'm going to, on third and 20, I'm going to call a play that might actually work rather than just dumping it off on a screen because I know Jimmy can't make that play happen. That, well, that's the funny thing about it, right? Because the Garoppolo, the Garoppolo thing is absolutely true, right? So Garoppolo's baseline PFF grade was 71 to 78, right? right? Purdy's now going to surpass that, which is what you see on film. But G Garoppolo also had the EPAs, right? The EPA people. Mm -hmm. Um, the people who might lean into EPA a little bit too much, uh, who are now in, in assigning it to quarterbacks and be like, wow, Jimmy Garoppolo is underrated. And they're just starting to come around, I think, to, oh, by the way, it might be Shanahan. It might be the open throws. It might be the playmakers. It might be the third and 15 screens that become first downs. But there were people who were like, Do you, have, you seen, have you seen Jimmy Garoppolo's career stats? Have you seen it? We should be talking about Jimmy Garoppolo more. I mean, so that's, that's the conflict there. We all watched Jimmy Garoppolo play on a Sunday night football game where he threw the ball to the defense two or three times and, came, and then came out of that season <laughs> fourth in EPA per play. That's, what we're, that's why Brock Purdy's not getting credit. We all watched Jimmy Garoppolo, scratched our head two or three times per game, and still saw, saw him lead the league in yards per attempt. Right? That's why Brock Purdy's not getting credit because the guy that Shanahan wanted to move on from was putting up otherworldly numbers for the level of play. Brock yeah. Purdy has upped that level of play and upped those level of the numbers, but it's still in the back of our head that Kyle Shanahan has Nick Mullins in the record book for the most yards in a 16-game sample to start a career, has Jimmy Garoppolo having the EPAs, you know, you know, screaming about how underrated he is. That's what Brock Purdy's up against when you're trying to figure out the difference of credit yeah, in the pie. And the thing is, in one sense, it doesn't matter. Like, in the sense of can the 49ers win a Super Bowl? Oh, that doesn't, the best it doesn't matter at all. No. Like, if you're defending them, none of that matters. Right? It only matters when you're trying to figure out the credit. Yes. Which is what we all do on these shows. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, lit, it's trying to evaluate how good is Brock Purdy when it matters. And then the other time it matters is when you're saying who is the most valuable player in the NFL, right? Because it isn't Brock Purdy, right? Unless... Unless you get back to that complicating factor of, well, does he become the most valuable player in the NFL because he actually supercharges Kyle Shanahan's coaching mind, right? Like the fact that he, the, the fact that Shanahan has Brock Purdy and has the confidence in Brock Purdy that he may never have had with another quarterback, right? Or maybe Matt Ryan. Like he's calling a game differently now. And that is the superpower. It's the fact that the best coaching mind in the NFL or one of the top three 
is now like he's on Adderall, right? Having Brock Purdy essentially puts Kyle Shanahan on Adderall, and he's like, well, like the you know the the sort of beautiful mind you know gifts were like. Yeah. It's all coming, it, the super mind is, is being unlocked by Brock Purdy. If you're making a case for his MVP candidacy, that's what it is. It's not that he's better than everybody else, because he isn't. Yeah, it is, it is very complicated. It is, I, I think you hit the nail on the head with the, who Brock Purdy is, the style. And that's why I'm intrigued by, remember, Shanahan wanted Kirk Cousins for years. Mm -hmm. Because he probably looked at him and said, I could, he'll run my system. Maybe the better than anybody. And by the way, he might. He like, would. I mean, think I, of the style of quarterback. I bet Kirk Cousins', Cousins is. numbers would be out of this world. And the type of like Kirk Cousins, whatever you say about him, is incredibly intelligent when it comes to X's and O's. Like if you listen to him describe plays, it's absurdly high level stuff. And I think he's good at doing it on an instant basis as well. And okay, every now and again, he's going to glitch. But, but that, that, that might be Kyle what Pur that might be real Maybe. Purdy's super right. superpower, right? Because Purdy's got the scramble drill touchdown to Kittle the other night, yeah. right? If you just look at Purdy's four touchdowns, there's a freebie on a trick play, there's a freebie on a fullback in the flat, but there's also a scramble drill touchdown to Kittle that Cousins and Garoppolo probably don't make right. as often. But so. also, you have to wonder, like, how you know would would Kirk Cousins ever get to that play because he's just hitting everything that's open, you True. know, every single play for Kyle Shanahan. It is, but this is this is why it's so complicated. This is why it's a bad conversation for Twitter because he's either MVP or he stinks on Twitter. There's no there's no in the middle. Yeah, I mean, there's other Jared Goff, man. Jared Goff had years where he had MVP caliber stats and years where he was terrible. Mm -hmm. I mean that that stuff happens. But that's the other. Like, but Purdy, it's it's impressive for Purdy because we've only seen him play well. Right. We've really only seen him play well. He hasn't he lost yet, player. right? In no. the, in the regular season. And but in the, the postseason, he didn't play in the game right. that they lost. The the last point I'll make about this is it's not a static thing either, right? Like that credit pie isn't the same every week. It's evolving. It's moving, right? So yeah. Brock Purdy may have start Brock Purdy slice in that pie however big it is, which we have no freaking idea, is getting bigger, right? You also tweet, you, you tweeted through that, right? In their biggest game, on primetime, he had his best game of his yeah. career. And that was what everybody watched. And then everybody was like, well, this is how Brock Purdy's been playing his whole career. And right. it's actually not. Like, yes. he hasn't played as well as he did on Sunday yeah, night. There, there are people out there that are like, oh, I knew this, you know, in, in game three. I, this, you just late to the party. I've said this all the way along. It's like, yeah, but we already seen. There's again. There's a. There's four game stretch where Sam Darnold looks like looked like this for the Jets, right? You can't say you thought he was that after four games because we've seen that happen before, where four games a guy looked exactly like this and then stopped looking exactly like this, and the whole thing fell apart. So you can't make that argument, right? Just like the people, I don't think. I don't think you can take credit for like looking at rookie Josh Allen and saying, this is who he's always been, right? Like now, looking at the guy and saying, this was, he was like this the whole way along, right? The, you're just catching up to the guy we saw from day one. It's like he wasn't, though. He was a very different player year one than he was in year three, four, and whatever. Like it's a different guy. This evolves. Brock Purdy now is starting to look like a different player than he was when he was in the job for like three weeks. And by the way, that only makes logical sense. Of course he does. Yeah. I mean, that's the intriguing part of it, right? Is that, yeah, Purdy, Purdy might get better. Yes. And, and that's the scary thing for everybody else. those types of numbers when, you know, some of it was, you know, third and 15 screens, he got away with some passes. Now he's actually playing better. And he's got all the same playmakers and he still has Kyle. And it's time to wrap up the show. Yeah. That was a good talk. That's what Wednesday is all about. Just talking and rambling and answering questions and having fun. Tomlin conspiracy theories. Tomlin conspiracy theories. All right. Well, we'll be back again tomorrow. We're previewing all of the week six NFL action. And uh, that's it for us today. Thanks for, to everybody for tuning in. We'll see you again tomorrow.